back with you once again, and yes, the Boston Bruins jersey's back on. 8-1 over Vancouver last night. <laughs> uh, some old-time hockey from the Bruins. They're going to go on and win the Stanley Cup. But, uh, back to, to politics as usual, I guess, in our weekly discussion of all things political and cultural. Uh, I First of all, right out of the gate, I'm going to assure you of one thing. I, I will be the one commentator you see this week who will not spend his program, his entire program, talking about Congressman Anthony Weiner or the pictures he sent of his Weiner. Uh, I figure everybody else is going to go there and let them talk about it. I, I want to instead talk about something a little bit more substantive, something a little bit more important, and something that a lot of people don't have the guts to talk about or that a lot of other people don't have the guts to approach. I'm going to talk today about something that people refer to as the third rail of American politics. And uh, basically what I'm talking about are entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, that kind of thing. And people call that the third rail because it's, it's supposedly kind of like a subway track. If you've ever had the misfortune of riding the subway, you'll know that you, you have, have the, the two tracks on either side of the subway that the train rolls on. And then in the, in the middle there, there's a third rail that's the electrical current that powers the train. And the thing is, if you touch that third rail, you get electrocuted. It's not a good thing. So entitlement programs have gained the name the third rail of American politics because supposedly if any politician goes near it of whatever party, if any politician touches that third rail, boom, they're zapped, their political career is over. Well, today, unlike a lot of politicians, I'm going to, instead of avoiding that third rail, I'm going to grab onto that third rail with both hands and hold on for dear life. So enjoy the ride. Uh, you'll recall a couple of weeks ago we had a little discussion about Newt Gingrich on this program. And Newt, I had stated at that time, had disqualified himself from the Republican nomination because of his comments about Paul Ryan's uh, cuts to Medicare and his budget. Now, of course, I said at the time that Newt Gingrich did not realize that he had disqualified himself from the race. Uh, I still don't believe he realizes that. He's still wandering around as though he's running. Someone needs to tell him that he's not. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it, it really did draw a line in the sand within the Republican Party in terms of Medicare and in terms of the uh, entitlement programs. And the Democrats picked up on it right away and started launching all the attacks on us about, oh, well, those, those Republicans, you can't let them back in power because they'll kill Grandma. Yeah, they'll kill off Medicare. They'll kill off Social Security. And then there was even a, a commercial that was out there that showed someone in a suit taking his grandma up on a cliff in a wheelchair and dumping her off into a stream or something. I mean, uh, so that, that, that has been going on quite a bit since uh, that whole controversy happened. And, and let's face it, the Democrat strategy when it comes to having a discussion about any type of budgetary cuts or any type of fiscal responsibility the Democrats' response is always to find some victims and parade them in front of a TV camera and uh, basically do a Washington version of a Sally Struthers commercial. So whenever, you know, there's some sort of even hit that we might go near Medicare, well, then they roll a bunch of old people in front of the camera. Or, you know, if we want to cut something in education, they roll a bunch of kids in front of the camera and have them look with their puppy dog eyes right into the camera lens and make everybody feel bad. And... Let's face it, for a lot of years it worked. A lot of people would, would back off when that happened. But I think there's a new generation of conservatives out there, and I'm one of them, who is willing to call the left's bluff on this kind of thing and, and is willing to stare right back and say, you know what, I really don't care. So I know that sounds pretty crass and pretty crude, but you're going to see why I feel that way momentarily. First things first, why am I railing on entitlement programs? Why, why am I telling you that we need to do something about entitlement programs and I'm not talking about all the other stuff in the federal budget. Well, there's a very good reason for that. Now, you can hardly be blamed, any of you who are out there, for not understanding the differences between uh, these entitlement programs and other types of spending. Let's face it, when you talk about budgetary issues in politics, most of the time, it is about as boring as watching paint dry. It is about the most unexciting stuff in the world. If you go to, to read about that stuff, you really got to plow through it in most books. But there are some very key things we need to remember, and I'll try to, to explain this as succinctly as I can without uh, going all economics professor on here. The 
the bottom line is that when it comes to the federal budget, there are two types of spending. Mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Now, what are they? Discretionary spending, that's, that's basically the stuff that uh, Congress people get in their offices or behind closed doors and figure out, okay, we're going to spend X amount of money in the military and X amount of money in education and X amount for this bridge over here and X amount for this program over here. And they work all that out and put it into a budget and go. That's discretionary spending. What is mandatory spending? Mandatory spending is something much more nefarious. Mandatory spending is something that is put into the budget by statute where the amount of the budget that's assigned to it, the figure that's assigned to it, is figured off of a formula that the Congress people don't have the opportunity to debate it and, and to negotiate the number or anything else. Instead, the original law was set up in such a way that the budget for that item is automatic. And it changes automatically depending on demographics and population and whatever other qualifying factors. So really, congressmen have a difficult time getting mandatory spending under control because there's no negotiation on it. It's in, it's in the budget in terms of a formula. You can't change it except through an act of Congress. Well, guess what? Social Security, Medicare, your entitlement programs, they are all mandatory spending. So that's why it takes a significant act of Congress to undo those formulas or to make adjustments to those formulas. It's not like you can just go back there and negotiate behind, a, you know, behind closed doors around a round table somewhere and negotiate the numbers down. You have to have an actual act of Congress to make any sort of changes to those formulas or, or to you know, get rid of them outright. Now, there's a lot of books you can read about this kind of thing. Uh, some of them will bore you to tears. A good place to start is Glenn Beck's book, Broke. Uh, I'm not telling you it's the final word on everything. It's not, but this will at least give you uh, an elementary understanding of this and, and of understanding what mandatory spending is and, and how the entitlement programs relate to it. Now, why is all of this important? Why is it important that we've got some programs in there, Medicare, Social Security, and whatnot, that are determined by formula in a mandatory way that you can't just negotiate down or forget to put in or whatever else. Why is that important? Well, it's the size of those programs. Uh, on the 2010 budget projected, um, entitlement spending was well over 50% of that budget. Now, think about that for a second. Over That means that over half of that budget is money that is not put there by congressmen. It's money that's not negotiated out. It's money that's not, you know, someone looking at our overall budget and saying, okay, well, we've got this much to spend, so I'm going to take X percentage of it and put it over in Medicare. No, this is all done by formula. This is all done automatically without any regard to what our economy is, without any regard to what our needs are, without any regard to anything else. It's automatically there, and it's very difficult to change, and it's over half the budget. That's huge. Now, some of you libs out there are going to yell and scream, well, if you're going to cut, why don't you cut from the military? Well, to give you a bit of comparison, that 2010 budget, uh, national defense and education spending combined were only 22% of it. Bottom line is this. Everybody on both sides of the aisle is talking about fiscal responsibility. They're talking about it in different ways. But if you truly want to get a, a hold on our debt, if you truly want to get a hold on our financial situation, you must address entitlement spending. You must address mandatory spending. There simply is no other way around it. Now, I know that's a sobering thing to say. I know there are people out there that are going to say I'm cruel and heartless and whatever else, and that you know, I want to kill off old people or something like that. That's not true. I don't want those negative effects to happen. I think, you know, quite frankly, that those on the left overstate those negative effects, though. I mean, think about it. In the history of our nation, these type of social programs, your Medicare, your Social Security, they're actually fairly recent. They're actually fairly young. Now, most of us don't think of them that way because they've been around for most or all of our lives, longer than I've been alive in my case. 
But in the overall history of the country, they're fairly recent, not until the, the 20th century. So we got through the 1700s without them. We got through the 1800s without them. What is it that suddenly changed in the early part of the 20th century that forced us to have the government to address providing Medicare? Nothing changed. What was it in the 20th century that suddenly demanded that the government needed to address the, 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 the issue of Social Security? Nothing changed. You know, what changed to where, in terms of Social Security, that people could no longer set aside money for themselves and income for themselves for their, for their retirement years? Did anything change where human beings could no longer do that and the government had to do that for them? No. The government decided they wanted to do it. Likewise with Medicare. So before these programs were allow, around, we got along fine. People's families took care of themselves. You had the charitable community, the philanthropic community, the faith-based community, all doing their part and taking care of these situations. There was no need for these programs to come into play to begin with. Now that's a forgotten part of American history. A lot of people don't, don't realize that or don't want to realize that. So when you're sitting there saying, well, if you get rid of Social Security, Medicare, etc. You're going to kill off old people and all this. You know what? They were taken care of before the government got involved. And those same entities can, can help take care of them after the government is involved. Now, let me be clear. Am I saying that I want to cut Social Security and get rid of it and, and Medicare and get rid of it tomorrow? No, I'm not saying that. And for all the controversy of Paul Ryan's budget, the bu his budget is not saying that either. Instead, what it is saying is we need to take a look at these programs and actually put them on the table and actually make some significant changes. Now, let me be very clear. I think that you're, in terms of Medicare and Social Security, your seniors who are, you know, 20 years away from within 20 years of, of collecting, I think they need to be allowed to do that. I think we need to grandfather them in. Quite frankly, they have not had an opportunity to live a life without having money stolen from them for these programs. So yes, they need to get their benefits. I'm not going to say anything otherwise. But for those of us who are younger than that, we need, we should not be expecting to get anything out of Medicare, anything out of Social Security. We need to have those programs phased out by the time we get to that age. And we need individually to take care of those issues on our own. So what I'm proposing is not an outright killing off of entitlement programs tomorrow, but we need to start looking for a way to phase them out over 20 or 30 years. Now that's the type of idea that a lot of Republicans won't even back. A lot of Republicans won't even have the balls to bring that up, but I will. Because the thing about it is, I've told you this before, I'm not a politician, I'm not going to ask you for your vote, I don't have to win your vote, I don't have to get TV ratings, I don't have to sell advertising, so I'm the one person that can tell you the truth. And quite frankly, when you look at the numbers, I think back to an old 80s song by the group ABC called How to Be a Millionaire. The first line of that song was, I've seen the future, I can't afford it. This spending is over half of our budget now. It is out of control. And it has helped create a mentality of entitlement in this country a mentality of laziness in some cases, it has done much more harm than good. So for many reasons, we need to look at the right way of phasing these programs out. Now, don't get me wrong. I know this kind of idea is going to be controversial. I know it's going to be met with a lot of vociferous disapproval. And heck, I'm looking over at Europe right now where there's riots left and right, and I know that type of thing is going to happen here when we have to confront this issue. No bones about it. I'm not going to tell you this is going to be pretty. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. But I'm going to tell you that it must be done. Because if it is not done, if we take the easy way out in the short term and we say, no, we've got to keep these programs alive so that you know, people don't riot and people don't get all mad, we're going to go broke. We're already broke. Our financial future is at a dead end. Simply put, we cannot afford this crap anymore. You know, let's, let's cut to the chase right here, okay? During the 20th century, we as a nation 
certainly Democrats, but a lot of Republicans as well, we as a nation performed a great experiment. We experimented with the idea of government being used as charity. We experimented with the idea of government being used as a social engineer. Now, if we are brutally honest with ourselves, setting aside all party affiliations, all ideologies, or whatever else, if we are brutally honest with ourselves, we will look at the 20th century, we will see the results of that social experimentation, we will see the results of that government-enforced charity, and we will say, you know what? It did not work. It failed. Social Security? Failed. Medicare? Failed. All of the social programs of the 20th century failed. So as difficult as it might be for some to say, we must now turn the corner and abandon that philosophy and begin looking for the most intelligent ways to phase out these type of programs. Our financial future depends on it. Now, a lot of Democrats will make a statement that Republicans want to end Medicare, Republicans want to end Social Security, and they will use it in a very derogatory way. They will say it almost as a slur. Let me go on record right now as saying this. And I am not speaking for all the Republicans. Newt Gingrich is proof of that. I'm not even speaking for all conservatives, although I think I'm speaking for a significant number of them. I'm only speaking for myself here. If your criticism is that I want to eventually phase out and eliminate Medicare and Social Security, my response to you is absolutely, unequivocally, yes. I don't see any way around it. These programs are unsustainable. Period. There's no math you can do to make them suddenly solvent. There's no creative bookkeeping you can do in the long term to make them work. We've seen a lot of short-term creative bookkeeping to, to make them solve it for a while and lock boxes and all that other garbage. But in the long run, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Numbers don't lie. So when we look at the numbers of the last hundred years, when we look at our financial situation where it is today, when we look at the budget as it stands, when we look at the formulas that force us to pay certain amounts for these programs, and we look at our GDP, we look at what we're producing, the numbers don't lie. Much like a losing poker player cannot blame luck and must look, him, look at himself in the mirror, we as a nation must look ourselves in the mirror. We perform the great experiment of Social Security and Medicare. It failed. We perform the great experiment of social programs and the government being used as charity. It failed. Europe has sold out to that type of idea even more than we did, and you see the hell that they're going through. We're going to have some very tough choices to make. And it's going to be ugly. It's going to be difficult. But in order to survive, we must go through it. We're like... We're like the crack addict that's going into rehab. We've been addicted to big government. We've been addicted to Medicare and Social Security. And we must now go through the difficult task of getting clean off of those drugs. We must go through that rehab, as tough as it is. We must go through the withdrawals. We must go through the shakes and whatever else. Because in the end, it's the only way we can survive. I know it's a sobering message. But you know what? I always told you I'd tell you the truth. I didn't tell you that the truth would always be pleasant to hear. Let's see if America can man up and make the mature decisions on these type of programs. If we can't, America will not survive. But if we can, then America can once again prosper. That's it for this week. America's Evil Genius signing off. We'll see you next week.